I guess good morning is in order to everyone. Welcome to another edition of Forum at First Presbyterian Church of Hastings, Nebraska. I am uh, Damon Jensen Heitman, uh, one of the pastors here. And today we're continuing, we've done a couple of forums sort of focused on the intersection of faith and politics. Last week, Dr. Bob Amio of Hastings College joined us and talked about political polarization and how it relates um, to the faith traditions of voters. And uh, this week, Dr. Catherine Viba, also of Hastings College, is going to join us and talk about William Jennings Bryan. So uh, with all of that said and done, uh, yes, a small little round of applause from Will Locke there. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, Dr. Biba, I will, I will turn it over to you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Damon and First Presbyterian for having me here today to talk about this. Um, when Damon came up to, with this idea of having the, um, and I don't know if you were the originator, but I'm going to give you the, the credit, um, <laughs> the idea of uh, looking at faith in politics, immediately I thought of William Jennings Bryan. Now, in part, that's because he's really strongly associated with Nebraska. So as any good Nebraskan knows, right? Okay, our, our kind of one famous national <laughs> political figure is William Jennings Bryan. Um, but he also has a really complicated legacy in terms of faith. Um, and, and I think that that makes him a really interesting figure and a really interesting person to look at at this particular moment in time. Meaning, of course, not sure if you know, but we have got election on Tuesday. <laughs> um, that's a pretty big deal. Um, <laughs> and, and faith is a part of that. And so, uh, I decided that that this would be a good time to take a look at um, at William Jennings Bryan and his legacy and the ways in which his faith played out um, in his policies and in a little bit in his personal life as well. Um, so the reason that I really like him is as um, Dan pointed out in our, our kind of uh, pregame con uh, conversations here a little bit, uh, Jennings Bryan, he has kind of a rough reputation in modern America. He's seen as kind of this stodgy old man, um, really conservative. And the reason for that is because the very final act of his life was defending um, or was uh, taking part in what is known as the Scopes monkey trial, right? That's the, the popularly known thing. Um, what that was, was in 1925, um, a, a trial that takes place in Dayton, Tennessee, and it is over the teaching of evolution in schools. Now, uh, Brian did not really support the idea of evolution on a couple different grounds. And one reason was he was really theologically conservative. Okay, so he tended to take the Bible fairly literally. And so what this meant for him was that um, evolution didn't really fit in with that for him. The other reason that he was opposed to it, there, and, and these are, we, we kind of hear the first part of that, we don't often hear the second part of that. The second part of it is, this is fundamentally against what he thinks um, the way that society should be happening. A major driving force of his life and of his concern was the poor. And so the idea that was drawn from Darwinism, right, the biological idea of evolution had been transformed in the preceding, you know, half century since that had kind of uh, come to the forefront was something called social Darwinism. And the idea that uh, society should function in the same way that the natural world did, basically the survival of the fittest. And this had some really unfortunate connotations. Um, a lot of uh, people who, promoted social Darwinism, um, also promoted things like eugenics, okay? So we should sterilize people who are maybe less fit um, to procreate. Now, of course, you can probably right away see the problem with that. <laughs> um, who is deciding who is more, uh, fit to procreate and who is not is a really loaded question. Um, and uh, so, so he really is against this in terms of eugenics and the idea that poor people, um, you know, if you, if you don't cut it in the world kind of financially um, or economically, if you're poor, um, 
that's just the way it is, right? So he doesn't like this sort of social application that um, evolution has. So he is opposed to it on both grounds, right? Um, but it's it's not just the biblical literalism, literalism that is driving him, but also that kind of social aspect of it as well. So anyway, what this what this comes up to for him is that he is very opposed to the teaching of evolution in schools, um, and he would prefer that it be taught as a um, as a theory and not as a fact. Um, and so several states in the South make it illegal to teach evolution in schools. So um, a man named John Scopes, right, the name of the trial, uh, decides that he's going to counter that. It goes and becomes a major court case. Everyone's paying attention to this court case. Um, and it's covered very intensely in the press. And Jennings Bryan, for all of his oratorical skill, doesn't come off super great in this, right? He, um, he defends it mostly on the grounds of biblical literalism, literalism. Um, becomes a major part of how he's making his case. And there maybe would be other better ways to have gone, across, gone about making his case, um, but that's the way that he goes. And um, so he's kind of mocked in the press for this. Um, he's derided by H.L. Mencken, who derides everybody, but <laughs> he derides uh, um, Brian for being kind of this um, friend of the ignorant, ignorant himself, anti-intellectual sort of person. And almost immediately after the trial, Brian dies. Um, you know, he's not terribly old. I think that would put him at, sorry, math there. I think uh, he was born 60, so he was uh, 65, so not terribly old, um, but he dies uh, shortly after that. So that's kind of his final legacy, and that's where that stops. Um, in 1960, there's a film called Inherit the Wind, which you mentioned, Dan, um, and uh, it stars Spencer Tracy, um, and the, the character of Brian in this film is really buffoonish, right? Um, he just looks like this backwoods rube who doesn't know anything about the world. Um, and it's uh, it's not a great look um, for, for Brian. And so unfortunately that kind of shapes the popular conception of who William Jennings Bryan is um, in you know, the latter part of the 20th century. And so far as anybody's heard of him now, a lot of times it's associated with kind of this um, you know, hillbilly sort of uh, fundamentalist figure, but that's not the full kind of import of his legacy. And so I'm, I'm going to go back and kind of talk about, you know, how, uh, how his faith shapes his career before that time. And maybe we can have a little bit more complex view of, um, of Brian. So He's born actually in Illinois. He's strongly associated with Nebraska, but he lives the first um, couple decades of his life in Illinois. Um, and his parents are really religious. One is Baptist and one is Methodist. Can't remember who's who, but um, they're both pretty religious and devout individuals. So they raise him with the sense that uh, religion is very important, but they also are a little bit unusual in that they leave some uh, level of self-determination to him. Uh, they allow him to choose um, kind of like what church he would like to belong to. Again, that's maybe not the same as like go and be a Buddhist or, or whatever, but um, <laughs> they are allowing him some uh, level of self-determination. And when he's a teenager, he goes to a revival at a local Presbyterian church. Um, again, making this, uh, <laughs> this uh, especially appropriate for this forum. Um, and he looks back on that as a really important moment for him and in his life. That's where he um, you know, has what, what we would re recognize as, I guess, a conversion experience. That's how, how he recognized it as well. And um, so he's very devout from that point on. He marries a local woman, Mary, who I think is understudied. She's pretty fascinating in her own right, actually. Uh, she goes to law school, passes the bar in order to, like, help him with his career, which pretty we pretty unusual for um for the 1880s uh to have a woman doing that sort of thing she learns german because she thinks that's going to be helpful to him in serving his client base once they move to lincoln so 
shout out to Mary. I don't think she gets enough credit, but um, anyway, uh, he marries Mary um, and they move to Lincoln, which in the 1880s is this kind of rapidly growing place. Nebraska is um, being flooded with settlements. Um, as you guys probably know, most towns around here are founded in the 1870s or 1880s. So this is um, a place where a young capable lawyer can really, um, you know, start from the ground up and build something. And that's exactly what he does. Um, so he sets up a, a legal practice in Lincoln and um, he's doing that throughout his political career, right? He is uh, involved with that um, to various extents. He has, I think, um, a really interesting sense in that in a lot of ways he is a career politician, like he's a presidential candidate three times, right? Like, I mean, and he's secretary of state for Wilson. Um, so, so he is in a lot of senses a, um, a career politician, but he's also doing other things. He has that legal practice uh, that begins and ends his adult life. Um, and he also is a newspaper editor. For a time, he's the editor in chief of the Omaha World Herald, although uh, he's actually not doing a lot of the editing, editorial stuff during that time. Um, and then he eventually starts uh, his own newspaper called The Commoner, uh, which is freely available on the Library of Congress, if you're very, very interested in this. Um, uh, the Chronicling, uh, uh, Chronicling America website, it has all of The Commoner digitized. Um, so that's all out there. But um, so he's got a lot of different hats that he's wearing. And so while he's in Nebraska, he really becomes attracted to um, a growing movement that's happening in the 1880s, um, in particular called populism. And uh, again, that's something that's uh, kind of changed <laughs> terms, uh, meanings a little bit in the last few years. Um, but at this point in time, it is a reflection of what's going on politically in the United States in the 1880s. What we have during this time period, here's where I would ask my class, can you name a, a president from the 1870s to the 1890s? Right, like <laughs> uh, it's the, the era of the bearded presidents, right? If, it, if you wanna think of it that way. Um, and they're not particularly well known. And the reason for that is it's not really a time period of really strong presidencies. Uh, the kind of prevailing attitude is laissez-faire. You probably heard that term, keep your hands off it, let the market, let the world do what it's going to do. Um, that works well for some people, doesn't work well for everybody. And someone that it's not working particularly well for are uh, farmers um, at this point in time. And so a lot of rural Westerners um, this is something that really has a great deal of hold in Kansas, Nebraska, um, further west. Uh, they're really disenchanted with this kind of idea that the government's not going to do anything um, in order to help like non-corporations or the elite. Again, history repeats itself, right? Some of these, <laughs> these issues that come up, come up again and again and again in US history. Um, and so the populists from this time period are, are pretty concerned with that. Um, the Democratic Party is also sort of struggling at this point in time. Um, they've not had a lot of uh, political power uh, immediately after the Civil War, right, for reasons. Um, they're mostly Southerners. Uh, so they're, they don't have a lot of political power until the 1880s when they finally get Grover Cleveland um, into the presidency. But there begins to be a split within the party um, between what are, are kind of conservative Democrats and um, more progressive Democrats. And Grover Cleveland is the embodiment of these um, conservative Democrats. And that tends to be the prevailing wind of the party. So there's not actually a lot of differences between the Republicans and the Democrats at this particular moment in time. So the populists are looking at this and they're saying, we don't really have <laughs> uh, any kind of, of way to go um, get our issues through here. Um, and so they're making certain demands. Uh, chief among them would be they want to coin silver as well as gold, right? There's the gold standard enact, enacted at this point in time. Um, and so they want to coin silver um, in order to inflate prices, uh, which they think is going to help out um, people who are, are lower in the socioeconomic ladder probably correct. Um, but this is uh, not a popular policy with a lot of Eastern um, bankers and um, the interests of both major parties. Now, where Brian gets a break here 
is in 1893, <laughs> and there is a major economic depression. Um, <laughs> Grover Cleveland is at the reins for this one. If you are at the reins during a major economic depression, never a good, never a good thing for your presidency. Um, and uh, and so it's at that point the largest depression that the United States has ever faced. That's since been surpassed a couple times, but um, 1893 is definitely a bad time. Um, and it of course hits poorer people and farmers uh, particularly hard. And so this really discredits kind of that conservative Democrat party, right? It creates more unease within there. And there's kind of this, uh, space for um, for Brian to insert himself in here. Now, he has been, his great appeal to people is that he's a heck of a speaker, right? He's a really, really, really good at drawing crowds. Um, he uh, has clear, concise arguments, maybe not concise, actually he talked they're pretty long speeches. It's the 19th century, right? <laughs> People didn't have YouTube. So they're like, okay, I'll go to a two hour political speech, no problem. Um, so he has really uh, concise, not clear, sorry. I use that word again, I need to stop. Um, really clear arguments, powerful imagery, um, and, and just a really great way of firing up a crowd. People travel to see him, like he's an event in and of himself. Um, and he uh, kind of gets this reputation as this rising superstar um, because he is uh, such a powerful speaker. So the first political office he holds is the um, United States House of Representative. And that's kind of what raises his national profile a little bit. Um, and he begins making these speeches across the country and he doesn't hold back, right? He really uh, punches at um, what he sees as this um, banking elite on the East Coast um, and really kind of uh, promotes the, a lot of these populist causes which are seen as really radical. Um, by a lot of Americans at this point in time. So he's in the House um, and he is nominated for president in, <laughs> for the first time, uh, in 1896. Now, how this happens, again, is on the basis of the fact that he is this kind of young superstar. Now, the picture we have of Brian is probably what you're used to. Just a second, I'm gonna duck out of frame here. Um, older, bald, right? Like a lot of that uh, kind of uh, thing that we're used to from um, the, the movie and just pictures of him. When he's nominated as president, he's 36 years old. Okay, so he's actually not, not old at all. Um, he remains the youngest uh, candidate for president um, and the youngest um, <clears throat> candidate to ever receive elect electoral votes in a, um, in a presidential contest. So again, it's, it's very funny to kind of think of that when this year we're looking at no matter who wins, the oldest president ever. Um, he's the opposite of that. He's four, dec he's four decades younger um, at this point in time. So he's actually a young guy, uh, really exciting, kind of energizing um, this base of Westerners. Um, and increasingly people are willing to listen to him because the country's struggling to come out of this Great Depression um, of 1893. And so he runs and it's a really competitive contest. He's running against uh, William McKinley and, um, and he doesn't win, spoiler alert, um, McKinley does, but it's really close. And this really makes his name for him as a political candidate. Um, Ironically, this also kind of spells the end of the populace as, an, as a viable third party. And the reason for this is because the Democrats basically co-opt the uh, very useful pieces of that platform. They're like, okay, this is a way that we can finally get that differentiation that we're looking for. Um, the conservative Democrat faction has been discredited. We don't really want to look like Grover Cleveland right now. That's not a good idea. Um, so they sort of pick and choose from the populist um, and attach it to the Democratic Party platform. And so he actually runs as a Democrat, not as a populist, uh, although he's mostly using their ideas um, or a lot of their ideas. And so that kind of um, ends the populist party as a, as a real third party um, threat in this era. I don't know if threat is the right word because um, that's, that's very loaded, but um, as a real option uh, during this time period.
Um, so that's his 1896 campaign. Um, he's nominated again in 1900. It's a rematch um, because the Republicans also uh, nominate uh, McKinley once again. Um, and McKinley uh, defeats him actually a little bit more handily that time. He wins a few of the Western states, including Nebraska. <laughs> Uh, Brian doesn't even win Nebraska in 1900, um, which is a little bit funny, although it's not unprecedented. I mean, uh, Trump is probably not going to win New York. So like this does happen, but um, it is a little bit um, unusual at this point in time that um, Brian has become, you know, this beloved native son of Nebraska, but in 1900, they don't even vote for him. Um, so uh, that's the 1900 election. Um, and so his star is fading a little bit, maybe, all right? Now, a couple of interesting things happen here. Um, Brian goes on a world tour. I, if anybody wants to pay me to do a world tour and write about it, like, let me know, because I think this sounds great. Basically, Brian becomes for a year uh, a travel blogger. Um, he, <laughs> he travels around the world with his family um, and writes back letters and um, they're published in newspapers so people can kind of like follow along with this, um, with this thing. And so it keeps him in the public eye, although he is um, not actually a, a politician um, actively at this particular moment. Um, and so that, that takes up most of his 1905. Now, he doesn't run for president in 1904, right? Like he, he sits this one out. The Democrats are kind of like, I don't think this guy can win, right? Uh, he's had two goes of it. Like we need to maybe try a different way. And they actually swing back the other way, right? They, they've tried this distancing from Glover Cleveland. We're going to be kind of this new progressive Democratic Party. Um, that didn't work. And so they go back the other way. Um, and so they uh, nominate a, a more conservative Democrat and it goes horribly in 1904. Uh, it, it, like he's crushed. It's, it's one of the worst electoral defeats um, in US history. Um, and so he loses, um, that would be to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, right? Who is a very charismatic, very popular figure. Um, and uh, that, that kind of ends that. So um, that is gonna open the door for Brian, right? Maybe he's not as <laughs> bad of an option as the Democrats think that he is in 1904. Maybe he is going to be, um, you know, more, uh, more viable once again in 1908. Now, the other thing that's happened, that's kind of what's going on in the Democratic Party. Um, what's happening is that the Republican Party has also started to sort of get on board with some of these quote unquote progressive reforms. This period from about 1870s to 1920 is known as the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. They always get grouped together, although they're, they're quite different, <laughs> but they get grouped together. And once we kind of breach 1900, we're in that Progressive Era. And what that means is that we're seeing an increase in reforms, all right? So it's really the end of that laissez-faire where government is gonna like, hands off, what happens happens, survival of the fittest, um, you know, that sort of uh, thing uh, is increasingly criticized once we get into the 1900s. Reasons for that, there's, there's a lot of immigration happening at this time. Um, there's a lot of muckraking, uh, which is kind of a negative term, um, but there's a lot of investigative journalism uh, is kind of what we would call it, um, of, of writers who are going in and kind of studying social problems. And so you've probably heard of um, The Jungle, right, uh, by, by Upton Sinclair. And he, so he's writing about the terrible conditions of meatpacking plants. Um, there's uh, writers who are covering lynching of black men in the South um, and all of these kind of really terrible social problems. We have uh, Joseph Reese, who's photographing uh, tenement conditions in New York City. Uh, so all of these kinds of things are raising awareness and people are like, okay, actually maybe we're not in such a great position here. Uh, there's a lot that could be changed. And so eventually the Republican Party is getting into this too, all right? So Teddy Roosevelt is considered um, by some measures a progressive president because he's adopting some of these kinds of things too. Now, in just a decade or two, this is quite a pivot all right, from these really hands-off policies 
to spoiler alert, by the time we have 1912, there's four different uh, presidential candidates running and they all identify as progressives. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really a, um, a shift in how people are viewing the role of the government, okay? And people like uh, Brian are really a major driver of that. They're saying that, look, it's not working to just keep our hands off. A lot of people are really suffering under that. And so we need to have some interventionist policies that are going to sort of offset the, um, the damages that, that unchecked capitalism or, um, you know, sometimes just like the weather events, right? If you're a farmer, it's not just like capitalism that may or may not be working against you. You are beholden to a lot of other things. So how can we kind of safeguard um, people from things that are really outside of their control? Um, if we're gonna be a prosperous nation, shouldn't we do that? And that's a lot of what the populists and Brian are espousing. And more and more Americans are brought over to that way of thinking um, by the 1900s. Um, so, so Brian is, uh, interestingly, um, by the time that he gets in, let me see if I can pull up a quote here, uh, really quick here. Um, yeah. So Brian, uh, what happens to him is that in 1906, um, he's, uh, he's a lot more palatable to the Democratic Party. And even Republicans don't see him as quite a quite as fearsome or or scary as he was before. Um, so uh, this this writer from this newspaper in Tennessee in 1908 is sort of musing on this, and um, they're going to run Brian as a way to offset Hearst and socialism. Okay, um, and so Brian is. Uh, <laughs> um, kind of gone this 180. Now, he hasn't really changed his positions all that much. Um, he's considered a radical in the 1890s. He's denounced um, by this writer's uh, thing, um, kind of evaluation as an anarchist and a firebrand. Um, <clears throat> but now he's sufficiently conservative to be palatable to even the more um, uh, conservative Democratic Party. All right. Come back to Zoom. All right. So Brian has his views haven't changed a lot, but they have kind of become more mainstream within a couple of decades. <clears throat> so he runs for president again in 1908. And once again, he is defeated. Um, and, and that marks kind of the end of his um, presidential ambitions, but it doesn't take him out of the public eye. The other thing that's happening in the 1900s is the uh, attempt by the United States to become an imperial power, all right? Now, there's still sort of this idea that if you're gonna be big time on a global stage, you need to have colonial possessions. France does it, England does it, like all the big boys do it. So the United States thinks we should do this too. And so they begin with this in 1898 with Cuba and then also the Philippines. And so Cuba is sort of the first kind of toe in the water here with this. The Philippines proved to be a lot more um, controversial. Uh, Brian himself supports the war in Cuba to liberate the Cubans um, from Spanish rule, but he's really, really uh, critical of what's going on in the Philippines. And the main reason for that is because the United States kind of takes over the Philippines with no clear exit strategy. <laughs> um, so with Cuba, the idea is like, okay, we're going to liberate it and we kind of have this path of what we think is going to happen there. It doesn't exist for the Philippines. Um, basically, the writing is, is pretty clear that the idea is to take over the Philippines as sort of this colonial um, power, uh, colonial um, possession. And Brian is very, very against this, right? And this goes against his ideas um, uh, as a Christian, actually. The, the idea that uh, for there to be justice on earth, people need to be free. And so it violates their right to self-govern and, and self-determine. So he is a very ardent anti-imperialist. And that is largely on the basis of his faith um, that he is champ championing this. 
um, there is a pretty strong current of anti-imperialism happening in the United States at this time. There's some big uh, names that are attached to it. Um, Carnegie, right, uh, is actually against imperialistic uh, powers. Mark Twain um, also is an outspoken opponent of this. So there's some some controversy about this. Um, and Brian is very much on the side that the United States should not be gobbling up these, these uh, overseas um, jurisdictions. Now, he has lost the presidency a number of times. At this point, he says, I'm not gonna run for president again. He does actually stick to that, um, unlike Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> but uh, he, he does not. But he is selected by Woodrow Wilson, um, who is the first Democrat to actually succeed in getting elected since Grover Cleveland's rather disastrous 1890 uh, run. And Wilson is elected for the first time in 1912. And he chooses uh, William Jennings Bryan to be his Secretary of State. This makes a lot of sense, right? He's still a really popular figure. He's a big name in the United States. Um, he has a lot of political influence. He did the travel blogger thing, right? So he's got the international experience. Um, and, and this is a good guy to have on your cabinet, really, by, by all accounts. It's a, it's a good choice for him. Um, what happens, though, in 1914, of course, World War One, And this is going to create a very vexing international situation for the United States. Again, remember, there's still sort of this current of isolationism, of anti-imperialism, the sense that the United States should not really be doing things in Europe, <laughs> um, or maybe even other places in the world, that that's not uh, the proper sphere. And Brian is very much of that mind. Okay. And so he advocates and steers U.S. foreign policy toward a path of neutrality. That gets challenged in 1915. There's a couple attacks on um, the, the Germans begin U-boat attacks, okay, rather infamously here. Um, they sink British ships, um, including the Lusitania, which really kicks up a furor because there are a lot of Americans on board, like 120, I think. Um, and, and they die, right? So uh, there's increasing pushes for the United States to not be neutral and to get on board um, with the Britain and France side of things in this particular contest. And Brian remains absolutely steadfastly against that. He says, look, the U-boat attacks are really bad. They're, they're very uh, terrible things. But the British are blockading Germany, right? They're preventing them from getting things that they need in order to care for their population, are these things really so different? He doesn't think that they are. Um, and so he is looking at this and saying, you know, that that's not justification for the United States to go to war. Um, and so he continues to push Wilson toward a path of neutrality. Um, and Wilson is getting more and more pressure to not go that way. And eventually Wilson, um, you know, begins to, to bend more decidedly toward, um, toward the, the Entente powers in Europe. And so at that point, Brian resigns. I think this is one of actually the most shocking things about uh, like in terms of, of political action is that he resigns on principle. Um, he doesn't resign from a scandal, right? Imagine that, uh, but he resigns on principle. He says, I think that this is the wrong thing and I cannot in good conscience work for a government that, uh, that believes this. He's not forced out. He's not, there's no reason for him to resign, except that he does have these very strong personal beliefs that steer him toward this path. And I, I think that whether you agree with him or not, that that is uh, fairly admirable to give up, um, you know, this, the highest ranking position in the cabinet and say, nope, I'm not going to do that um, because I, I value my personal beliefs um, more. Like, I really think this is a case of right and wrong. And I can't go against that. <laughs> um, and so I, I find that very admirable and, and rather impressive uh, for Brian. Um, and ultimately, of course, uh, Wilson campaigns in 1916 on they kept us out of the war and then in 1917 goes into the war. So <laughs> that's, that's what happens there. I doubt Brian really could have uh, avoided that. I, I don't, you know, it probably was if that was something he couldn't do, resigning was probably the right call because I, I think that that would have not been something he could withstand. Um, but I do find it quite, quite impressive. So after he leaves the, 
that position. He's not particularly active in government matters. He does campaign for people. Um, his brother is actually more politically active during this time period. He's um, His brother is governor of Nebraska two or three times, can't remember which. Um, uh, so, so he is involved, but only tangentially. This becomes a period of time where he is more um, involved in his faith personally, like that becomes uh, kind of a point where, where he is um, uh, working in Sunday schools and teaching in churches and doing things like that. He actually moves to Florida. Um, his wife, Mary, her health is not great and uh, Nebraska winters don't agree with it. Um, and so they move to the Miami area and um, that is where he's at. And so it's there that the Scopes, uh, Scopes trial kind of catches up with him in this um, very religiously focused and less politically focused phase of his life. Um, so that's kind of William Jennings Bryan. I won't say in a nutshell, cause I did actually talk for quite a long time, um, but uh, he does have a really interesting kind of uh, legacy. Now, the reason that I think he's really interesting for this, there's no political saviors. And so he kind of exists in this area where we want <laughs> him to be that. Um, but he really hasn't caught on in that way because in some ways he doesn't really fit this. Um, a lot of uh, kind of fundamentalist Christians that might be like, yay, William Jennings Bryan fighting the good fight against evolution. They can't with his uh, rather progressive social policies, right? They can't reconcile those two things. And progressive Christians who might want to champion him as this example of the Christian left, are they, they run into the stumbling block of, of what he does in Scope's monkey trial. And so he's this really interesting contradiction um, of, of viewpoints, right? That today in 2020, we wouldn't probably see fitting together very naturally. Um, it would be hard to find a person that has kind of these really different viewpoints um, that, that Brian espouses throughout his time. And so I think that that has hurt his historical legacy. But what I think is great about that contradiction is that it shows that he really did kind of go his own way and that his faith influenced his politics instead of the other way around. And I worry what we're seeing right now in America is maybe the other way. Um, where people's politics are, are influencing their faith. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, Brian is not a perfect figure. Like he's really not. Um, for example, his views on race are, are pretty problematic from 2020 perspective. Um, one of the articles that he runs in the commoner is, is a, basically affirming the idea of the white man's burden, um, which if you're familiar with this is um, the idea that, uh, um, white European descended peoples are, are naturally superior and so they have to help, their burden is to help um, other civilizations um, rule themselves because they can't do it on their own. Okay, so not particularly enlightened in, in some of the racial uh, areas that we, so we can, we can criticize them. So he's not a perfect figure um, and, and I don't think that that's fair to expect really of anybody to be a perfect figure. Um, he can be criticized for those things and we can still say, you know, like this is uh, in some ways a good model for us because he is someone who is letting his faith shape what he believes about the world, even though it doesn't put him in a tidy box. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that that would be something that a lot of Christians really need to kind of wrestle with today. Um, and I think that in the, here's me, like not necessarily scholarly, this is me just kind of observing the, the present situation. Um, I think that seeing the outcome of the last 10-ish years um, is going to be really interesting. There's, there's probably a lot of dissertations hidden within this in terms of what progressive Christianity might mean. Okay, so in the, the 2016 election, there was a lot that was talked about with evangelicals voted this way. They support Donald Trump, right? And that's, that's a really reliable block for him. But of course, that's not the whole of American Christianity. And I think that you're starting to see um, kind of a set of people who are politically homeless in a certain way. Uh, there's things that they really don't agree with 
with um, like pretty major planks of, of both parties that they don't agree with. Um, but they're starting to um, become more independent voters to vote ways that they um, would never have considered voting 10 years ago. Um, and I think that that's gonna be a really interesting outcome to, to kind of follow uh, over the, the coming decade to see if that you know, swings back, if it causes a loss of faith, what does it mean for the church? What does it mean for American politics? I think there's a lot of really interesting questions um, that we're gonna see coming home to roost there. So um, yeah, so right now we have kind of the religious right that feels like that's American Christianity and politics, right? That's, that's kind of the label that gets stuck on it. Um, and yet I think that that is, is pretty reductive. Um, and so, uh, I think that, that Brian is a great reminder of that, that we need to think about what does it mean to us if we're Christians um, to have faith in things like justice, to have faith in the idea that all men are created equal and like uh, in the image of God, that, that people are created, um, that, that God you know, does not see differences between men and women um, and races. How can that affect how we behave or how we vote, how we use our voices in um, a political sphere. I think it's a really important question for, again, this is me speaking not as a scholar, but as a person of faith, I think that's a really important question for us to grapple with um, and not have it be, you know, this is how I was told to vote. Only good Christians can vote this certain way. I actually saw a tweet on that, by the way, one of my friends shared that and someone, and someone shared a tweet by a Christian leader who said, a friendly reminder that any real Christian cannot vote for Joe Biden. It's like, oh, okay. Um, and, and it's like, I, I feel like that's an example of politics influencing faith, right? To, to make that kind of judgment call. Um, that as Christians, we should be reflective, we should pray, we should seek guidance and scripture and think about who really is going to maybe be the best choice, if not a perfect choice um, for the things that we profess to believe. So I don't know, that was a little rambly. I'm sorry. Do you have any questions about uh, Brian and um, this kind of interesting space that he, he occupies? Catherine, I'm wondering, you know, the suffragist movement was happening yes. at mm -hmm. this time. What was his opinion? I, I'm really dismayed to hear about the white man's burden because you know what you had what you had previously said about what we overlook in the Scopes Monkey mm -hmm. trial is that he opposed the social Darwinism. Mm -hmm. But then on what what grounds did he base the white man's burden? Now, obviously it wasn't social Darwinism, but he still had a kind of a hierarchical view of, of the races. And that's one question. But then the other mm -hmm. question is, what did he what did he feel about the suffragists? Okay. So the first part of that, again, like he's a product of his time. And I don't think that lets people off the hook. I, I absolutely don't. Like um, when I'm teaching my students about here's why people supported slavery, I'm not saying these are good reasons. <laughs> I'm saying, let's understand kind of where this is coming from. And so I think that part of that is, is he is really living in that particular moment where um, there is a belief in, in white supremacy. Um, he travels to all these areas across the world. And while that does inform him in certain ways, it also reinforces kind of what he wants to see, right? So like he sees this tribe in Africa or whatever, and he doesn't see, you know, he sees it as uh, kind of regressive and primitive because that's what he expects to see, to be honest. I mean, because of, of what he's grown up with and, and kind of the prevailing thing. Um, I think that that's a lot of it. Um, I also think, I don't know that he has a lot of interaction with African-Americans, you know, like he, the late 1900s, like we're in full-throated Jim Crow. He's in Nebraska, which doesn't have like a very numerous African American population, even at that time. Um, so again, this doesn't let him off the hook, but I, I think that he is very much a product of of ways of thinking there, and and that's a place where we can say, you know what, you should have gone back to your Bible maybe and, and thought about that a little bit, a little bit more fully. Um, and I, I, you know, so um, I agree, it's disappointing. I want him to be like. <laughs> I want him to fully live up to those things. Um, it's also a, a good reminder, like this is why I'm really opposed to great man history. Um, 
and the idea like that we have kind of like like we put these historical figures on pedestals and it's like I have not yet found a historical figure that is like really worthy of just pure pure worship you know like like that just you know mortals right we <laughs> we don't have it in us and and people are full of contradictions and um and and so is Brian. I, I, I don't have a more um, satisfying kind of um, answer so than that. As a now, product, the good news. Oh, go ahead. As a product of his time, he also did he oppose the suffragist movement and the women's vote? No, you'll like this answer. He was okay. a he was in favor of women voting. Um, oh. Yes. So so he did. And, and that was a reflection of his idea that um, that goes back to the 1890s where people should be involved in in their political system. And so he saw this as if you're gonna be a representative government, there's no reason for, for women to not be voting. So he was in fact a supporter um, of the suffrage movement, more so than uh, Woodrow Wilson, who really uh, was was pretty pretty not great on that. Um, <laughs> uh, so he he did, um, he was he was more progressive than a lot of the, the Democratic Party at that point in time in, in that respect. Go ahead. Oh, well, another, I, that's really interesting about your great man position that <laughs> that'll give us plenty to think about. But what comes to my mind, one of my heroes, Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. laudable in so many ways, but so flawed in so many mm -hmm. ways. By the way, for some of you, he was a great tree person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you would know that. Yes. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that that's, I think maybe a way for us to, to kind of approach history and sort of push back against that great man thing is to remember, is to get more comfortable with the nuance, right? Yeah. Uh, Jefferson, for example, like he's brilliant. Like he, he has a great political mind. He's a wonderful writer, you know, like these things can be true and also be like he raped his slaves right like like that's bad um both of these things can be true and we can say this is bad and this is uh you know pretty inspiring and cool right these things can coexist um without excusing you know the stuff that's that's not great because history's littered with the not great like yeah <laughs> Uh, we've got about about 10 minutes left here and um, that that idea of um, flawed flawed people um, doing things in the world um, <laughs> it, it reminds me of I see a lot of this um, in in religious figures in particular but also even within the scriptural witness itself um, and Dan maybe you can speak to this a little bit like there's part of what you're talking about um, that reminds me of this, like that we're all just making it up as we go and, and trying to sort it, trying to sort it out, I guess, as we go. Um, and I think about the Apostle Paul and his letter writing, who at times writes things that are, are undeniably seem to me, at least to be universally true and powerful and um, inspiring. Um, and at the same time, uh, doesn't do anything to, to, to speak out against. He condones slavery. Um, he, he had some, some other parts of his writings that are, are problematic um, or confusing. <laughs> uh, problematic, probably at worst. Confusing, probably at best. And, and so we, I see that popping up in lots, lots of, lots of places. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think this idea that you're describing of uh, I'm thinking of it as what's driving the bus right um, is, is my faith driving the bus or is something else driving the bus I think that's an important question for people of faith um, not just when we interact with the political realm but um, when we interact with the economic realm and when we interact um, in the social realm and in the educational realm and um, and all of those sorts of things like when I'm thinking about, oh, how am I going to do Christmas this year? Um, it's, it's really easy to do Christmas from a, from a capitalist uh, point of view and not so much from a faith point of view. Um, so it's not really a question, I guess, just a series of 
relatively rambling comments. <laughs> I welcome musings. Those are great, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I think that if, yeah, I, I agree with that. I love that metaphor of who's, of what's driving the bus. I think that's a, a good way, you know, and here's the other takeaway from that too. Like maybe it's a good reminder for us to have humility. Like Brian didn't get it all right either. Like he tried probably more than a lot of people try um, to have his faith driving the bus. Um, and there's still things where, as you know, Dan point, like he whiffs pretty hard. Um, and, and maybe that's a good reminder to us too, that even with our best intentions, we're probably not going to be right 100% of the time. And that's, I guess, a good reminder for us to have humility and, um, you know, some, some kind of, uh, recognition that, uh, best intentions, we, we still might, might not be you know, where we want to be. Catherine, I appreciate what you had to say about politics informing our faith now. And, and you know, in the past, faith has informed politics, as you pointed out with Brian, but it just seems like since, boy, since the Reagan era and increasingly mm -hmm. right up to the present, we've turned this corner to the point where politics is determining faith and that that yeah. politics is the lens well i should say in a particular party <laughs> it seems to me that politics is the lens through which faith is going to be interpreted is there any precedent for that in in american or you as a historian i mm -hmm. don't see that there is but you know i'm not a historian either so yeah i mean that's a great question actually <laughs> um and and one of that I would like to think about more. Um, right. I think yeah. there, in some, there's some ways that make this a different moment, right? Um, I think that in the past, the United States was a little bit more religiously uniform. Okay. So if you're looking at the 1900s, people might disagree on various things, but they're still by and large coming back to a similar uh, kind of faith background overall. Okay. Uh, that's not the case now, right? You have uh, just a lot of different, um, you have a, a large number of non-religious people, uh, all kinds of different faiths. And so you don't have that. And so I think that that one makes people feel more defensive, right? And so they, they, they're, the, the mode of their cultural power has increasingly become political, right? This is how we can keep that cultural power that we're really anxious about. Um, <laughs> uh, because we don't have kind of the domination culturally that we maybe used to, or we think we used to, right? Um, how often have we seen like America was founded as a Christian nation? Like, well, maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> um, maybe not as much as you think it is. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's, that's part of it. Um, the other thing too is I, I think that, you know, it's it's always difficult to kind of paint with a broad brush. Like the Unitarians like are like pretty far out there in the 19th, in the 19th century. Um, but they're also ones that are advocating for a lot of reform movements and things like that. And so I think we see it on a smaller scale. You're definitely correct. I would say that that it's uh, pretty unprecedented and the, the formation of the religious right is a really key moment in terms of this uh, marriage of faith and politics. Um, I think politically, and, and I'd be interested in hearing um, Dr. Amio's opinion on this, like one of the most brilliant things the GOP did was forge that connection, like, like strategically brilliant move. Um, don't think it did great things for, for faith, right? Like that's kind of my own view of that. But politically, that has given them such a solid base. Um, and, and you're right, like, it, again, I, I think it's very sad because I think that if your God can fit in the box of a political party, you are serving a very small God, right? Like uh, God's not American, <laughs> God's certainly not an American Democrat or an American Republican, like, right. like it's bonkers when you break it down like that. <laughs> that, that's such a weird view to have. And yet, yeah. as you say, that's kind of where we're at, where if you're a good Christian, you can't vote for Joe Biden. Like what? Right. <laughs> like, well, and, and Bob last week added to this is that not, you're not only talking about Christian nationalism, but you're also there's been, and I don't know when this has happened, but it's been very recently, 
white Christian nationalism. There has been this, yeah. you know, white supremacist, if you want to call it that, uh, nuance to it that um, that that I find pretty scary, actually. Yeah. Um, I will say there, is, and you probably know this teaching religion that. Uh, it, it has been something that's been used by various political movements, not just in the United States, but uh, in other areas of history as well. And the reason for that is because people believe so strongly in their faith, right? Like it's a very um, motivating sort of thing to have. And so if you, as a political leader, are able to associate yourself with that, you are going to get really strong adherence. You're going to get really faithful following because you have um, kind of tapped into this thing that is so compelling and so meaningful to an awful lot of people. I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop in here real quick and draw us to a close. Um, Can I do two quick book recs? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a teacher, right? This is what I do. Okay, so if you're really interested in um, a great book about the history of the American church and race, I recommend this one. It's called The Color of Compromise, and it's by Jamar Tisby, who is both an ordained pastor and has a PhD in history. So like, great, great work. Um, and so this is um, a really, I think, interesting uh, the subtitles, the truth about the American church is complicity and racism. And so it's a hard book to read, like I'll level with you. You're going to feel icky. Uh, <laughs> but I think that if you're, if we're interested in issues of racial reconciliation or of doing the work of saying like, how have we as Christians hurt, uh, our brothers and sisters, this is a really good way to a really good book for that. So The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. Uh, the other book, if you're interested in William Jennings Bryan, <laughs> uh, is A Godly Hero by Michael Kazin. Kazin? Kazin, I think. Um, this is wonderful because it's, it's really fine-grained uh, biography, but it is looking uh, in particular at kind of, it's almost an ethical biography. Uh, it's really looking at um, the role that his faith and personal beliefs play in what he is doing. Um, I also like it in that I think it's pretty, uh, pretty fair. He doesn't hold bars, uh, doesn't bar hold, I don't, sorry, <laughs> he doesn't really hold back when discussing about those things that are kind of problematic that, that we talked about too. So he really, um, sometimes when you're, and I understand this as a historian, you get really attached to the thing you're studying or the people you're studying, and it can kind of lead you to soft pedal certain things, unless you're studying like John Calhoun or something, uh, who's just 1000% terrible. But, um, uh, you know, I think Kazan does a really good job of breaking down and saying like, <clears throat> uh, here's some of the problems with what he believes, uh, but also here's why he's doing some of the things that, that are really interesting and, and unusual for his time. And so um, a godly hero, the life of William Jennings Bryan, that is a great uh, resource if you're kind of interested um, in the nuances of that particular life. All right, that's all I have. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fine. Uh, so my thanks again to Dr. Catherine Biwa. My thanks to all of you um, for joining us. I have to go get dressed for church. So um, until next time, uh, next week, uh, Dan uh, will be back leading, uh, I think we have a three-part series of forums. Mm -hmm. Dan on the, taking a look specifically at the Gospel of Matthew. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about some of the sort of key characteristics and uh, perspectives and viewpoints and points of emphasis, um, then- What makes then, Matthew unique in many ways among the gospels. Yep, yeah, so, uh, so I'll hop in for that, same time, same link, uh, same, all same rooms. You'll all be in your same rooms. So uh, there you go, uh, until next time. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And it's nice to meet you.